This is the S50. Hello, world. This is the CS50 Podcast, Episode 3. My name is David Malin, and I'm here with CS50's own Colton Ogden. Indeed. Uh, last time, you know, to sort of to segue into what we've talked about recently, we were talking a lot about facial recognition. Mm. Sort of, you know, that's an emerging thing. We've gotten better at it. Machine learning has gotten better at detecting people's faces. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that, there are a lot of security issues. And this week, it seems like there are a couple of incidents in the news related to facial recognition. First on the list being the New York City subway system, actually. Indeed. I saw some articles pop up where there were LCD screens of sorts and cameras there pres- supposedly to capture fare jumpers, people who are trying to sneak through the gates without actually paying. But the interesting thing about the screens was it wasn't just like CCTV or closed circuit television, like in the UK, where you see yourself on the screen or at a convenience store here, but rather there were little rectangles appearing around all of the faces in the image, which suggested indeed they were actually detecting faces, which was worrisome. Right. And uh, the company featured on the video feed was WiseNet, which has been known for its facial recognition software. Um, So presumably the folks... Specifically, New York Times analyst Alice Fung was concerned at seeing this, and uh, yeah, it sort of raises so. issues. You know, how many companies are out there? You think gathering people's facial information and using it to make decisions? Well, it's it's probably increasingly present. And the funny thing is, here they, to their credit, graciously showed you the fact that there was facial recognition going on, which was probably part of the purpose, right? Because I recall that uh, recording in progress and please pay your fare were among the messages on the screen. So there's probably a bit of psychological feedback there such that you realize, oh, not only are they filming me, they like they recognized me in some sense, even if purportedly they weren't doing anything with that information or tying it to an actual identity. But you got to imagine that this probably does happen in other contexts when there isn't a C- uh, an LCD screen. And certainly when there aren't little rectangles around your face, you can still do it in real time or in post-production even. And to your point, I mean, previously, computers are only getting faster and smaller. People are going to be able to implement this technology everywhere and we won't even notice it's there. Yeah. Well, and you know, I've been thinking about this for some years now, as have you know privacy experts, certainly. You know, all of us, myself included, like a bunch of dummies have been uploading for years photos of ourselves to social media and tagging our ourselves, essentially training these machine learning models to better detect us. I mean, my God, we're sort of actus accidentally or unknowingly or unwittingly opting into all of this. I wonder how much of this Facebook is uh, sold to other people. Yeah, well, I mean, they what a powerhouse the they of- and Google and Apple and others. I mean, my iPhone can detect faces and that's in real time, certainly. If I were to take a photo of you right now, I'm going to see a little rectangle on your face. Right. No, exactly. And uh, I mean, the New York City subway isn't the only you know, in the news, the only sort of organization that's been using this sort of technology. Also, JetBlue recently has had a uh, sort of a recent scandal in that Mackenzie Fegan actually posted on social media. She was allowed to get into her flight um, just by not even having to use her boarding pass or the like, but actually getting her face scanned. And that proved to be enough credentials to get access to her flight. Yeah, I think it completely caught her off guard, as it would have me if it were I in her situation, because uh, apparently they had grabbed data from like the U.S. State Department. And this was supposedly a legitimate usage, but it was not something that was particularly well disclosed or documented, certainly as far as this passenger goes. And, you know, frankly, that would make me uncomfortable, especially if a private business now, which JetBlue is, is using data that was collected, it sounds like, for the governmental purposes, whether it was for passengers or for some clearance purposes or the like, I mean, all it takes is for one person to overshare and then that information too is potentially in hands you don't want it to be in. Yeah, based on what I I read, it seemed like JetBlue actually wasn't storing the information themselves. Um, They were using the United States Homeland of uh, Department of Homeland Security and sort of almost like an API on their part um, and actually authenticating the information with them and there wasn't actually any storing of the data, but it does make you wonder... um, whether companies are, one, telling the truth about this, and two, um, if they're using this sort of technology and not disclosing it, how much is actually getting stored where and when? Yeah, and this is happening so quickly. I mean, it wasn't, well, actually, maybe it was that all that long ago that I was in graduate school, but I'm thinking back as though it was yesterday when I was in graduate school. And I remember one of the uh, my fellow graduate students gave a talk. I think it might have been his thesis defense so at the end of his grad program, where he actually turned a webcam or some camera on the whole audience who was there to see his talk. And in real time, he blew everyone's mind by actually showing in real time little rectangles or whatnot on top of everyone's faces. And that was bleeding edge at the time. And now I think we're all rather desensitized to the fact that computers can do this. And now we seem to be entering the phase where people are starting to realize what the information can be used for. It's not just to playfully tag friends and family and photos or to find photos among your iPhone or Android photos. Now it can be used to really identify you as a, as a biometric 
detail. It's kind of scary. Um, I mean, there are pros and cons, I think, to having this be more widespread, easily available. Um, uh, pros potentially being, depending on where you are, it, whether or not you want your you know face visible, whether you want to be tracked. I mean, this could be good for law enforcement, mm. certainly in certain cases, but as a as a as an innocent citizen, this might not necessarily be great, knowing that you know, the government and potentially a lot of private entities know where you are at any given moment's notice. Yeah, I mean, you could imagine there's Nest cameras, for instance, in the U.S. are pretty popular just in home for security devices. I mean, you could presumably start logging every passerby who strolls by your house just by patching your own hardware into some API or to some website that can actually do the facial recognition for you. Yeah. And it's amazing how good it is, right? Like, even on Facebook, when we post photos from, from CS50 from the class, I'm astonished sometimes when it notices is even in the smallest of photos, the smallest of faces are actually picked up as an actual recognizable human. So you don't even need all that good of an image. Or even like profile shots too. Yeah. Or side, I think that's the right term, when the, the side of the face, that's a profile shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's it's pretty frightening. Also frightening, um, the UK cyber, sur- uh, cyber survey recently talked about some of the... Um, some of the information they've gathered recently, it's a little bit disconcerting. Certainly, you've talked about this before a lot, um, you know, insecure passwords and uh, some of the most common insecure passwords. Yeah, this is a, sadly a recurring topic. I think the number one password yet again was one, two, three, four, five, six, I think was the number one password. 23.2 million victim accounts worldwide. <sighs> you know, and so let, let's let's. Uh, flesh this out a bit. Why one, two, three, four, five, six? Like, how did twenty-three million people all decide on that one? Would you think um, it's incredibly easy to remember? It's right there on the keyboard. Granted, and something get, tells me that the systems all of these twenty-three million people are using probably has like a minimum password length of surprise, surprise, six digits, six characters. Yeah, exactly. Another uh, very popular password located right below one, two, three, four, five, six uh-huh. on the keyboard is QWERTY. A QWERTY, because on a typical keyboard, a QWERTY keyboard is a it's called that's the top row of keys on the top left they released the top 100,000 passwords that they found and I believe that was number three on the list below one two three four five six and I think password yeah um and it's disconcerting just how many people are doing this but we we, we preach this all day long and it doesn't you know seem to necessarily work all the time we can't change the world perhaps but I would like to think and hope and I'm sure there have been studies that could quantify this that at least the rate of People are being educated, hopefully, and as the software is getting better, as the corporate policies are getting better, people's habits are hopefully changing. But no, I'm sure both of us know people who have pretty weak passwords. In fact, am I looking at one right now? No. Can you think of one account that in the, is just kind of a throwaway? In the past, uh, I think I was guiltier of this growing up, but I think especially in the last five years, I've grown to be not only avoiding using the same password on multiple accounts, but making sure the passwords I do use are long, 10 characters plus, have mixed characters, special symbols, numbers, that sort of thing, which I think uh, websites nowadays are doing an excellent job of detecting this ad- in advance. Yeah. I've noticed when I've been registering for sites, they'll typically say, ensure your password is X characters long, has a special character, dollar sign, exclamation point, you know, what have you. Mm. Um, even things like parentheses, these are nice because people don't often think to include these in their passwords. And it's it adds in yet another character, you know, some program used to brute force passwords has to add to the list of digits it needs to, you know, exponentially account for in each yeah. digit of the password. Absolutely. But some sites, frankly, are annoying because they will explicitly enumerate like what symbols you can use. And at that point, my level of interest in choosing the password according to rules really starts to fade quickly, right? They should not be confining me to type only a subset of printable characters. Frankly, there's a couple hundred characters that I should be able to express on my typical keyboard. And frankly, I think it's often that people misunderstand what dangerous characters are in the context of like a SQL database base. We talk in CS50 about SQL injection attacks and the like. And so people put these artificial constraints when frankly just sanitizing the user's input and escaping potentially dangerous characters like semicolons or quotation marks in SQL or other languages is really the solution. So some people I think just aren't really getting the message. They're hearing that I need to make it, I need to insist on difficult to guess passwords, but they don't necessarily appreciate the implications for UX or user experience, which is what's nudging people in the first place to choosing weak passwords so that they can simply remember them. Sure. That makes total sense. I'm guessing people might, uh, as a precaution to your point, 
avoid using things like parentheses because they fear getting a SQL injection attack. I mean, if you're looking, if you're using a password manager like we do in CS50, which mm-hmm. we've talked about in prior podcast episodes, um, often you'll see characters like that, things like curly brackets, parentheses, dashes, what have you. Um, everything's fair game. Yeah, and no, and you can just let the software generate it for you. And, you know, I've been such a fanboy for so long of password managers that all of us, of course, here on the team use. But I gotta I gotta admit, I, I've heard now in the wild of the one corner case that you don't want to happen. And this comes from uh, he or she shall not be named, but one of our most amazing uh, colleagues actually conveyed to me recently that they forgot the one thing you can't forget when using a password manager, which is your so-called master, the password, master password, the most important, the only password that you have to remember. And uh, gosh, I mean, I can only imagine the stress then of having to go through and change dozens, hundreds of accounts, passwords. So, you know, this is sort of a multi-tier problem where you probably want to have, frankly, a printout of that master password, maybe tuck it away into a bank vault or something like that, tuck away under the mattress so at least no one can, with some probability, find it. But it's a tricky thing to navigate because it's probably not the most secure thing to keep it only in your head because, God forbid, you do forget it or lose it or you don't use it for so long that it just fades away. Now you got a problem. And heaven forbid your master password is one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Hopefully the software is good enough to <laughs> defend against that. <laughs> Uh, on the heels of terrible passwords, turns out that uh, there was a terrible password uh, exploitation event at a, a tech company called Citrix, actually. Yeah, I read. So we actually used years ago Citrix. But they were very well known at the time for load balancing hardware. Nowadays, it's so much easier to do this in software and in the cloud. But Citrix made load balancers hardware that lets you have multiple servers and spread lots of users load across them. And I think what was hypothesized here was that one of their internal very important accounts was compromised by uh, just a brute force attack, trying a whole bunch of random or non-random passwords. Case in point, you can just grab these lists of the most popular passwords out there, start with those before you even do start to brute force things. And I think they noted that because the accounts in question or account in question didn't have two-factor authentication, like a a key fob or a unique code associated with it, that they ultimately found uh, an important account. Yeah, access. this is huge. Two-factor authentication, I mean, we use that for everything. It just it really sort of, I mean, this is an old idea, too. From what I understand, this is done, you know, with, like you're saying, physical, literal physical devices back in the day, pre-iPhone era. Yeah, they it's would, gotten easier yeah. with software, certainly. And, um... Yeah, that was the really the main thing. Spray password spraying is the term. Literally, just throw this 100k list that yeah. uh, that the UK Cyber uh, Council had released. You know, just use those passwords, and then I mean, how many companies do you think uh, it's a gold mine for hackers out there? Oh, absolutely. Twenty three point two million. You know, it's kind of fun to joke about what the top passwords are, but these are actually real attack vectors to actually use that data for not for good, but for for evil. Yeah. No, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. But in better news. Have you Happy heard, thoughts. Have you heard uh, Apache's migrating to GitHub or I, has migrated to I GitHub? I did. CS50's own Cold and Octon told me about this, in it's, fact. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah, no, I mean, Apache Foundation has so much uh, open source software that we ourselves have used for years. Like Apache, the web server, for instance, is one of the biggest and the most popular. And I gather they've migrated a lot of their code base that's already open source, but to a new platform, GitHub, uh, which is kind of where it's at, certainly. Um, Not the only such service, but certainly a popular one. Yeah, uh, making their code, I mean, really accessible to millions and millions of developers. Yeah, but to be fair, I mean, their source code, to my knowledge, was always open source, just in different places. I mean, for many years, SourceForge was quite the thing, and it still exists, although it doesn't have nearly the same cachet or feature set as your your GitHubs, your GitLabs, your Bitbuckets do. And even among those last three, I mean, GitHub probably still has the highest profile. And it's kind of an interesting signal. I mean, even I, rightly or wrongly, when I'm sort of Googling around looking for open source solutions to problems we have, libraries or packages that I kind of want, you know, I'll see something on one of these older platforms like SourceForge and think, oh, I wonder if it's actually still actively maintained. Whereas if I see it on GitHub and I also see some commit history in recent days or months, that's a pretty useful signal. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder how much of that is a function of being on another kind of source control platform like Mercurial. Maybe people just don't yeah, want to go through the issue of losing all of that history that they would have to inevitably transfer. I don't know if maybe there's a way to actually migrate that to Git somehow. You can, and GitHub actually supports multiple protocols, just Git is the de facto perhaps most popular nowadays. But I can totally appreciate how folks who sort of 
you know, are very comfortable using one platform or think SVN or Mercurial or whatever is just better than Git, that's fine. So I, I think it's important not to become a hater just because one service is more in vogue or one technology is more in vogue than the others. I mean, it doesn't necessarily solve any more problems putting your code on GitHub than putting it anywhere else. But it's just, it's certainly consistent with trends these days, perhaps. Yeah. I mean, to your point, I think GitHub is just the nicest user experience for I do think control. the UI is terrific. Yes. Yeah. I do think uh, they, they got a lot of those details really right. And that's really, I think, why so many people are using it so so much now. I mean, it's just a pleasant environment for the millions of developers out there. You're going to want to spend your time enjoying your workflow, presumably. Yeah. No, it works well. I mean, we internally certainly use it all the time. And actually, we just started last night as recently as last night's uh, playing with a feature that GitHub rolled out some months ago, I think now called Code Owners, maybe even a year or more now, where you can actually specify in a special config file, which to be fair is specific to GitHub. It's not a Git thing per se. So we're starting to get a little proprietary in that sense or a bit of lock-in with certain platforms. But we use this config file called Code Owners to specify which of our CS50 staffs quote unquote own a, a particular file or a subset of the file so that now I know, and you and I were talking about this last night, if someone wants to make a change to a particular the important config file, I will be automatically notified and I need to approve it. And it's just kind of a nice comfort that we can't accidentally break each other's work. We're going to notify each other automatically in the, for the right context. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I mean, GitHub, <laughs> it, at that point, it's... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just a beautiful way of describing it. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, I'm gonna say, I was, what I was going to say is that, you know, it sort of ventures out of the territory of source control and more into project management in that sense. Oh, absolutely. So... But I can see some tensions here, too, when it comes to these open source platforms. We are starting to get a little more locked in the more and more of these features you use. But I do think features like this clearly were created to solve some people's problems. And I, frankly, I'm, I'm really glad this particular one exists, though undoubtedly other source control platforms provide similar features as well. Indeed. I, I need to go maybe do a little bit of exploration if they're still around. I don't know. GitHub is picking up a lot of steam. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we for oh, quite a while used Bitbucket uh, for past courses that I've taught. They were terrific early on about providing free repositories for personal use, for educational use uh, when other platforms like GitHub weren't. So um, there's definitely some options to consider. GitLab being another big one. Yeah, and on that note, I mean, GitHub fairly recently has allowed, I don't know if it's unlimited private repos, is it? For, uh, for up to, There's some limits, but they're quite generous now. I think ever since the Microsoft acquisition of GitHub, they've gotten a little more flexible it seems with what they can offer. Yeah, previously you didn't get any, is that correct? Uh, you hmm. would have to pay unless you signed up for the educational plan, uh, which they were also very good about granting, but there was a process. You had to scan your ID or upload a photo or the like, so there was an approval process that could be hang up for some folks and uh, some email addresses. Hmm, indeed. Um, interesting design thing from Instagram. Yeah, speaking of UX. Uh, the, uh, it turns out that they have uh, in their Android code, there was a little bit of a design change that they were, um, I guess, going to roll out in the near future. Well, at least it's buried, it seems to be. Yeah. At least it's available, maybe for A-B testing or such. Sure. Um, essentially, the feature is that only somebody sharing a post will be able to see the total of number of likes that a post gets. In other words, if you're looking at a post and you haven't shared it yourself, um, you actually have to like it or not like it on just the merit of the post itself. Yeah, it's like those things you have to, those polls online, you have to vote before you can even see the results. Which is kind of an interesting idea. How do you feel about this? I don't know. I've been thinking about that. I'm not qualified, I think, to have an informed opinion on this, but I, I certainly have gleaned from reading articles over the past few years that you know social media has exacerbated certain tendencies or people's sort of obsession with others' behavior or certainly a time sink to, at, at best. Um, and so there is this sort of herd effect that you sometimes get where people might be upvoting based on past upvotes. They might be in, uh, internalizing what it means for people to be upvoting your posts. So frankly, this only seems like a solution to one problem. Um, indeed, it seems to be potentially unhealthy if too many people, especially maybe adolescents who are just growing up with technology for the first time, are a little too obsessed with others' perceptions of each other. So, I mean, these are very powerful knobs that the Instagrams of the world and the Googles and the Facebooks more generally are starting to turn in interesting ways and perhaps hopefully rolling things back a bit so that we're not all so fixated on what each other are doing every minute of the day. Yeah, I mean, as a as an experiment, a social experiment or what have you, I think it does have interesting grounds in that sense. Gather some data, see how that changes people's trends. Yeah, and you know, even I'm guilty of this. When we've uploaded CS50 related photos or photos of me that get tagged, I take this perverse interest in seeing how many upvotes some particular photo of our event or, or some aspect of the course has gotten. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not sure that's actionable information. Like, what am I going to do with the information that suggests this was upvoted a lot? 
not, other than derive some weird sort of gratification, perhaps, um, or just sort of pride. I guess pride is is okay, um, but I'm not sure it's the best focus, right? I mean, I think it's the communication capabilities of these platforms and the shareability of maybe moments that's important, but the upvoting, the downvoting, the the smiling, the laughing, I, I don't know. This is certainly benefits the platforms because it keeps the users engaged, keeps them coming back, keeps them sort of a, a sticky asset, um, but I'm not sure it's doing us humans any all that much good. I would wonder, you know, in the context of something like Amazon, if you couldn't necessarily see the number of reviews on a product or the number of stars on a yeah. product. In that case, it's different because you're actually making a financial decision to purchase a good and that's comparing a it to signal. other goods. Even there, that's a whole can of worms with fake reviews too and sussing yeah. that out. True. But what is interesting there too is when, it tell, frankly, this is useful when you want when you need an accessory for something. Like you buy one of those Swiffers, like the little uh, brooms and you need the replacement parts, uh, the little cloths. It's really useful that Amazon tells you people who bought this also bought that because you don't have to go searching around looking for the related things you can use that signal so yeah it's thank value. you machine learning it, it makes amazon more that's not money. even machine learning that's just some loops <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i mean it's good though that that stuff is important like it, it saves amazon uh well it makes amazon money and it saves us time mm. trying to find that stuff and time guessing is, they prioritize it for the former reason probably though. probably but uh maybe the more time we have the more money we can spend i there, guess there we go <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what apps like instagram ultimately do because i mentioned this was kind of buried in the code and it's possible they might be using it experimentally and for those unfamiliar an a b test generally refers to the process of trying out a new idea but only on a subset of users so group a gets the feature group b does not and you sort of analyze uh the impact of that feature on that user base sure sure uh have you heard of this thing called uh 768k day you know i hadn't because i actually missed 512k day <laughs> some years ago do you uh, do you know what 512k is well so kilobytes i believe and it refers <laughs> to how much memory a device might have and my understanding of the situation is that back in 2014 uh, I we missed I missed 512k day, which was when the amount of memory in the that was being used by various routers routing tables. So essentially spreadsheets that have some rows and columns that map uh, IP addresses to the uh, directions that they should be routed to on the Internet at the risk of oversimplifying, a.k.a. routing tables was capped at like 512 kilobytes. And uh, uh, one of the big router manufacturers rolled out an update that added a few more more thousand rows to a typical routing table that put it over the edge and the whole internet broke is the oversimplification. So kind of like a Y2K. In a sense, where Y2K was more about humans made a conscious decision to represent information using a finite number of bits, whereas this is really like the hard drive ran out of space or the RAM overflowed because it was all being used. So this was a solvable problem by just throwing more memory at it. But some of these routers were old enough and maybe uh, passively enough maintained that people didn't realize that they were about to overflow their memory banks, so to speak. And this memory is sort banks, of a, I, I sound old. <laughs> <laughs> this is sort of a function of just having having a lot more networks come out of the woodwork across the world than we anticipated. Yeah, it was an interesting litmus test of like, hey, raise your hand if you only have 512 <laughs> kilobytes of RAM because you went down on that day. So 768K day is nearly upon us, which is apparently when those routers that were a little pricier back in the day had 100, 768 kilobytes of memory, and that too is about to be filled up. It's, it's kind of crazy. I mean, uh, presumably this is a lot. Uh, I would assume if routers back in the days, people were thinking about this problem. Oh, it's all about efficiency. I mean, yeah. yeah, you want to use only as much memory as you need and you want to keep things super compact. So these are very low level devices with very uh, minimal overhead. Hopefully we don't see as crazy of a shutdown at seven. I, from what I was reading in the article, um, 768K shouldn't be as disruptive as 512K day. I think there. I think there were more routers at the time that were suffering from that lower memory threshold, um, but we we are getting very close. We're very close to uh, um, this new sort of pseudo apocalyptic digital <laughs> day. But it's interesting to see this trend in industry. Like this certainly happened with Y two K, and it's going to happen again in what twenty thirty eight when we run out of seconds since January first, nineteen seventy. Oh, for the uh, Unix time, so the Unix, Unix timestamp, time. the thirty two bit, the thirty two bit timestamp. If I'm getting the year and the math right, 
Um, but it's interesting because humans seem to, in tech, have this tendency of solving problems, let's say, at the last minute or slightly too late, um, because all of these are foreseeable problems. Even Y2K, we could have foreseen in, in the year 1970. But of course, folks assume that, oh, we're not going to still be running this hardware or this software at that point. And at this point, too, you might just have human personnel change over. So you might not realize that some of your devices have these limitations. So it's kind of interesting how these very conscious design decisions at the time that might have been perfectly reasonable, especially when memory was scarce and expensive, like was the right call, but it comes back to bite you like decades later. And it's not even you necessarily. It's like the people who succeeded you. So this will probably be more applicable to maybe older, smaller businesses that don't have the latest uh, routers, modems, that sort of thing. Maybe, but if you're a small business, you odds are you're not running necessarily your own routers. You're simply connecting your small local network to uh, a bigger fish, so to speak. So um, I think it would, uh, I'm not sure exactly who should be most worried here. Sure. But I will. I, it has got me thinking even about things we teach, for instance, at the university level, things like SQL databases and representation of integers. Right. We talk in the class, CS50, about ints and big ints or 32-bit choices or 64-bit choices. And this is one of these things where there's not necessarily – it's not a big deal these days to use eight bytes instead of four. But it's an interesting opportunity to kick a can even further down the road, so to speak, you know, because it's going to be a lot harder if business is booming or restoring a crazy amount of data some years from now, it could actually be really time consuming and really expensive for humans to go through and fix all of the database tables, all of the, the, the code that might actually be writing one data type or the other. Then, you know, let's just spend more memory now if we can afford it and avoid this problem altogether. It's a really interesting trade-off, I think, as to just how far down the road you kick the can. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, 64-bit is a lot. It's a lot of information. It is. Well, um, not in cryptography, though. That's that's tiny little That's true. You need at least 500, 512 bits there. For sure, these days, if not more. Yeah. Um, Chrome. This is interesting. Yeah, those of you who like incognito mode. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, they're going to make it harder to block incognito browsing. So some companies can detect whether you're using incognito mode. Yeah, this say, is kind hey, of really annoying that. in recent years, even for development purposes when you're trying to understand a website and it says, sorry, can't do that, you're in incognito mode. Yeah, this is uh, apparently websites are able to detect whether Chrome has the its file system API open, um, which it doesn't. If you're in incognito mode right now, you can actually use that. Yeah, the ability to read and write files locally. And like news sites have increasingly been using this because they don't want you and understandably like accessing the content for free if you've already exceeded your free threshold, for instance, for the day or the month. Right. But they've been using this side effect by trying to use this file a uh, API in browsers, and if it fails, they have up until now, at least on Chrome, been able to infer, oh, you're probably using incognito mode, and that's why it failed. Right, and uh, in order to get around that, essentially Chrome cleverly plans on using a sort of a temporary virtual file system. Yeah, it's very smart. In RAM to trick the... Uh, the server into thinking that it does have access. Yeah, so you'll be able to read and write data. It just won't be to the place that you think, but to the website leveraging this technique, you won't be able to distinguish uh, incognito from non-incognito. It feels like the right thing to do, even if that is a reasonable business decision to try to prevent people from just throwing away their cookies constantly in order to access more and more content for free. It certainly is not consistent with the spirit of incognito if you're leaking information. Indeed, yeah. Um, and these websites, I think, are you know open to a, certainly adopting a subscription model and making some of their content premium if it really is a huge, I think, detriment. Yeah. Although, um, I mean, that, that gets, I'm sure, complicated. You know, having free articles certainly drives a business, I have to imagine. Yeah, but I do think this is the right technical call. And, you know, frankly, props to the folks who figured out that you could infer incognito mode from these, these side effects. I mean, that's kind of a clever hack or, or workaround, if you will. Yeah. Um, I mean, that pretty much is all the topics that I brought to table today. But I think what we should do is end the episode on takeaways. Takeaways, okay. What are, Change what, your password if it's one, two, three, four, five, six. That's probably the biggest <laughs> one, I think, to, in today of today's theme. I mean, there are a lot of interesting things that people don't necessarily have as much control over. Um, facial recognition, I mean, we can't obviously tell people to cover themselves. No, but we could stop tagging ourselves on Facebook. Yeah, that's true. To be fair. That's not going to happen. <laughs> okay. We take, too, we take too many photos with our with that show our faces in them. But the password thing, I think, should start to sink in more for people. I mean, there's going to be an annoying amount of 
sort of activation energy to go find a password manager, download it, get comfortable with it. But it's worth spending those minutes or those couple hours or just to kind of have an inconvenience for the first couple of weeks until you get acclimated to it. But then once you're into the the rhythm, it really is compelling. And and for those who are unfamiliar, LastPass is pretty popular. 1Password is pretty popular. There's others. And you should do your own due diligence and Google both because undoubtedly both have had bugs, security related bugs indeed. So they're not fail safe. So they too are written by humans, but it's probably better better than your current system. If your current system involves post-it notes on your monitor. Don't do post-it notes. <laughs> or one, two, three, four, five, six, or some other such password. Because it doesn't even matter if you don't think that y- people care about your particular account, as in the case of uh, Citrix's case, the uh, adversaries didn't care about getting into a specific person's account, I believe. They just wanted some account that might have some potentially interesting access. So you're really vulnerable to just random attacks that your account might get compromised as the result. They're going to brute force it. 23 million. That's easy just to spam everything you know, password 123456, and, and that's hope not that even it works. 32 bits of address space. No, it's not even close. Yeah. And uh, if you're using the you know multi- or the same password to multiple locations and it's 123456, your whole life can be ruined really fast. Wow. Or at least, we're ending this on a positive note. At take least, uh, maybe not ruined, but <laughs> temporarily compromised if you're fortunate. If you're okay, okay. I'm scared now. <laughs> <laughs> Change your password if it's horrible. There we go. <laughs> Quite fair. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Yeah, thanks so much. This was an awesome episode. Thanks, David, for, for uh, coming here and doing this podcast with me. Indeed. We'll keep an eye on what's in the news. And by all means, online, feel free to chime in with topics of interest to you, things that might be helpful to explain, to discuss, and explore. Absolutely. This was the CS50 Podcast, episode three, zero indexed. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>